Two bad things jump-started my parents into an evil stretch. Drinking and fighting. I suspect if Daddy had ever talked about such things, he might have said Mother's drinking and mullet grubbing drove him out of the house. Mother said that Daddy just bailed out during Grandma's cancer and after the funeral, which Abson set her to drinking. I don't know who or what to blame. Nor can I figure what exactly led to Mother's near-fatal attack of nervous. Maybe drinking caused her to go crazy. Or maybe the craziness was just sort of standing in line to happen and the drinking actually staved it off for a while. All I know is that first mother was drinking, then she and daddy were fighting worse than ever, and finally they were hauling her away in leather four-point restraints. Drinking was not a totally new hobby in our house. Daddy always drank, but with few ill effects. And every now and then he'd come home lurching around like a train conductor. And I remember a few times dancing around the kitchen in my nightgown with my bare feet on his steel-toed boots, both of us sliding around in the yummy cloud of whiskey he was breathing. But that was it, really. Mother was another story. She'd set down the drink when Grandma came home to die, out of necessity, I guess. <clears throat> then she picked it up the night she got back from the funeral while we were all, all rubbing on her. She'd said, could I fetch her some gallo wine and seven up from under the china cabinet? combination she likened to sparkling burgundy. And I said, sure. Then I walked as slow and miserably as any mule through any cotton row in order to assemble that drink. At some point after that, the wine made her hanker for alcohol of the high test variety. Then she dialed up the liquor store to order vodka by the case, and she reached down the biggest jelly glass she could find in the cupboard. There was no need for ice or a shot glass or even vermouth or those weird baby onions people who play at Gibson's make such a fuss about. The vodka was sloshed out in five-fingered units. Oddly enough, she hated the taste so much that she literally had to hold her nose to swallow the first one like a kid taking medicine. But after that, she downed them the way people in hell must down ice water. The big game for me, once she'd started drinking, was to watch her and gauge which way her mood was running. My sister Alicia didn't have a stomach for watching her that close, so she put herself in charge of counting mother's drinks. She kept a long-running tally of both the number of drinks poured and the approximate number of ounces consumed. And she did all the siphoning in her head, minus pen and paper. Somehow, having exact numbers reassured Alicia no end. Even so, you just never knew what would happen once Mother unforked that bottle. The difference between two drinks and ten might not even show. So while my technical-minded sister counted, I myself zeroed in on the lines of Mother's face and the timbre of her voice in hopes of divining the degree of nervous she might get to. One big <coughs> tip-off to her mood came from what record she popped on the turntable. If she was feeling high-minded, for example, she'd play opera. Opera had a big downside, though. It could lead Mother straight into the worst sort of crying jag. Some Italian soprano would start caterwauling how she lived for art, and some tubercular female would rasp out, in Italian, of course, come to Paris and be my breath, to her old boyfriend, and Mother would go weepy. Her face would settle into a series of faint lines you normally didn't see on her. Then she'd bawl like a sick cat hanging her head in her hand, blowing her nose on toilet paper, and saying that we didn't understand and that it wasn't our fault she was crying. Like we cared whose fault it was instead of just wanting it to stop. Those were the opera nights. The jazz nights were a little worse. And worst of all were the nights when Daddy was home and Mother put on the blues. 
months. My birthday was set tonight. I should have known what was coming. But mother's bacon at meal was on you, which smell I love better than breath itself. I was also waiting for daddy. I've been sitting on the back step the better part of the afternoon, holding back a floodgate of talk just for him. When he finally showed, I started to prattle about how I'd gone with mother and Leisha that morning to buy my birthday dress. It was black crepe, the first black dress I'd owned. Just sitting in it made me feel like a movie star, I told him. We had hell finding the kids dressed in black, but Mother had driven us all over the county. We at last settled on an A-line dress that had a big white clown collar hanging all loose and drapey with three bona fide rhinestone buttons down the front. Alicia took one look and said, where's the funeral? But when I spun around in it, Mother thought I looked like the ballet dancer in my Japanese music box. Even though it cost $63, she rolled her eyes and said, what the hell, when she handed the sales lady her charge plate. Not ten minutes later, she'd also bought Leisha a chemistry set from the toy department. On the way home, we'd stop for a shrimp run a lot at Al's Seafood, where Mother made the quick work of two vodka martinis to celebrate. When I finished telling him, Daddy said the dress looked pretty while he wiped his feet. He wasn't even looking my way. Then he slipped into the house. Suddenly it dawned on me that I wasn't to tell Daddy who charged all that stuff on Mother's plates. Nobody said it was secret, but he wasn't drawing any pay, a fact he harped on more or less constantly. All he talked about was how Gulf Oil was trying to chicken shit the working man out of a decent meal. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that what Mother and Leisha and I had done that day was cross some unspoken line between good times and bad behavior. I also knew that the black dress crossed another line between an outfit and a get-up. Later, after I changed out of the thing and was back in my blue jeans, I was on the rug undressing Barbie for the umpteenth time when my parents' mad voices floated back. Alicia was next to me, trying to pin her Barbie straw-colored hair into a French twist with a bobby pin. I couldn't make out the words, but the gist was plain. Mother roared and slammed kitchen cupboards. The screen banging signaled Daddy's walking out and his boots scuffed down the steps. The screen banged again and I heard the glass lasagna casserole shattering on the patio after him. It's her birthday, you son of a bitch, Mother yelled. He showed, just wound that French twist into a tight coil and said, Take 10, real 1,000, happy goddamn birthday. <laughs> Out in the kitchen, Mother stood at the sink, holding both her wrists under running water. You could see a big splotch of red under her sharp cheek, under her sharp cheekbone, like somebody had dab mad on her face with a paintbrush. You want some aspirin, she said to me, and I said, no thanks. Mother tossed a handful in her mouth, then dipped her head under the faucet to wash them down. She took the German chocolate cake from the top of the fridge. We can have this for supper, she said. I told Mother that she could take the dress back. It was no big deal. No, I can't, she said. Then she started planting candles in the muddy top of the cave. Forget about the dress, for Christ's sake, she said. I went outside, making my way around the glass and splattered lasagna, and into the garage, where I could at, see, at first see the ruby end of Daddy's cigarette and nothing else. Then I could make out his white t-shirt and the glint of the bottle he lifted to his lips. Daddy, I said. Just go in the house. Go in the house, Pokey. Then he said, almost like an afterthought, why don't you go on in and ask your mother if she wants to head over to Beard City for, for some barbecue crabs. I don't remember our family driving across the Orange Bridge to get to the Bridge City Cafe that evening, nor do I remember eating the barbecue crabs. I don't remember how much Mother drank in that Bayou Cafe where you could walk to the end of the dock and toss your leftover hush puppies to hungry alligators. My memory comes back into focus when we're drawing close to the Orange Bridge on the way home. From my spot in the back seat, I can see a sliver of Daddy's profile, his hawk beak nose and square jaw. I want to see Mother's face to see which way her nose is drifting. But I'm staring at the back of her head in its short, wild tangle of auburn curls. All at once, the car rears back the way a horse does underneath you if it shies away from a small, skittery animal, and we're climbing the bridge. The steel webbing of the road sets the tires humming. The night streams over the car and fans away like black water. I can almost feel a long wake of dark dragged out behind us. 
Lisa rolls down the window. Her hair is sprawling loose from its French twist. The wind's about to suck me out the window and over the bridge rail. I muster all my courage to look out at the long drop down. It makes my stomach lurch. The steel girders jig by in fast staccato. In the distance, I can see two flaming refinery towers. They make a weird Oz-like glow that bleeds up the whole bottom part of the sky. Out beyond the river are marshes and bayous. A, lar a black large barge moves slow under the bridge. Mother is shouting, shouting she wished herself dead before she'd ever married Dad. She wished she'd been struck by lightning on this very bridge before she crossed over into that goddamn bog. Leechfield is the asshole of the universe, the great nowhere, and Daddy is a great nothing. I feel over for Alicia's hand, and it's as cold, then it's a cold fist knotted shut. Then out of the darkness, I see Mother's white hands rising like they were powered and lit from inside, like all the light in the world has been poured out to shape those hands. She's reaching over for the steering wheel, locking onto it with her knuckles tight. The car jumps to the side and skips up onto the sidewalk. She's trying to take us over the edge. There's no doubt this time. I mash my eyes closed, and Leisha heaves herself over on top of me, and I can't see anything, but I can feel the car swerve while Mother and Daddy wrestle for the wheel. Then there's a loud noise in the front seat, like a branch cracking, after which the car goes steady again. I can almost feel the tires click back in between the yellow lines. When Leisha and I crane from the back seat, we see that, amazingly enough, the car is off the bridge and back on the road, safe. Mother's lying slap-jawed against her window where Daddy has socked her to get control of it. When she wakes up, we'll be pulling into our driveway. She'll rake her fingernails all the way down Daddy's cheeks, drawing deep blood so he looks for days like some leopard's paw has gone out. The kids playing night tag will stop their game together and watch us spill out of the car. The mother's still trying to claw daddy, daddy holding her wrist in his iron hands. At some point, Joe Dillard will sidle over to ask me what they're fighting about, and his brother Junior and his wise ass voice will crack, probably fighting over a bottle. Then mother breaks loose from daddy to stamp her foot at the group of kids, and they scatter like buckshot into their own dark yards. And that's it. That's what I remember about my birthday. Mm -hmm.